one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So uh, we want to note that because when we go further in our study, you will see the fact that despite that prophecy, God was still giving Esau opportunity to be the first. Now we are told that when the when the days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red, it was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out. His hand took hold of Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Their father was 60 years of age when they were born. Now, two things I want to quickly note here is the fact that these children were born in answer to prayer. These children came as a direct answer to the prayer of their parents. The Bible said to us that Isaac pleaded with the law for his wife because she was barren for 20 years that they have married. They didn't have a child. So this cry that Isaac cried to God and entreated the face of the Lord for his wife and God answered. So let's note that the children, they were born out of prayer. Secondly, I want us to note that they were twins. And if they are twins, what it means, and you can see the way the Bible said, the second was holding, took hold of Esau's heel, which means they are not delayed twins at all. Which means if there's any time difference between the two of them, it will be less than five minutes. The way we are told that uh, the boy, the Jacob was holding the heel. Now, so just for five minutes of coming out first before Jacob, that already confers on Esau the right of the firstborn. For doing nothing, for not even growing two years ahead, he has the right of being the firstborn. And everything that Isaac had, as because Esau came out first, he was supposed to be the firstborn, and he was supposed to possess the right. And he was supposed to have been the one that would perpetuate the genealogy of Isaac. What it means that Isaac that have inherited Abraham, Esau will have been the direct line to inherit Isaac. All that Isaac had, whether cattles or houses or land or whatever, by virtue of Esau coming out first, he had the privilege of being the first, and he will always take first. Even though Jacob is going to be given anything, Esau will be the administrator of whatever Jacob could have. Now, that's the first thing I wanted to look at, the privilege. Now, the next thing I wanted to check, still while we are looking at that chapter, verse 20, we have read up to 27. Now, we are told that the boys grew. That's another matter I wanted to get quickly. They were not incapacitated. They were not malformed. So Esau did not have any, any mismanagement in growth. The Bible said the boys grew, which means they grew well. His limbs were not damaged. He did not have any congenital problems at birth. He did not have any disability that could have been a hindrance to him. Unlike we had some other people in scriptures that could have been born into an inheritance like the son of Jonathan, who as he was growing up, because there was a challenge, a trouble, the nurse 
mistakenly dropped him and he, he became lame in his two feet. And for that reason, even though he would have been the one to inherit all that Jonathan could have had been entitled to. Even when David said, is there anybody again in the house of Jonathan or of or Saul that I can bless? But because he was damaged, he couldn't grow well, there was nothing he can do. He had to be carried up and carried down. But this was not the case with Esau. This was not the case with Jacob. So Esau had opportunity to grow well. So for him actually to possess the inheritance, God did not incapacitate him. God did not reduce his privileges. God did not uh, do anything that would have made him uh, unable to enter into his inheritance. Now, again, I wanted to mark something more. We noted in verse 28 that we're told that an Esau loved, I mean, Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So again, I want to note that Esau was not disadvantaged at all. He was a favorite for the father. The father loved him. And because of the games he used to bring back from the bush, the father loved him. All of that we can note in that particular chapter that we have read. Now, but I want us to go a little further. The fact that these two boys were born on the same day, but Esau, having that privilege of being born first, so he became the firstborn child in the family of Isaac. Isaac also loved Esau, which was another privilege for the boy. He again had the golden privilege to receive the blessing of the firstborn when his father Isaac was about to die. He was a man of divine privileges. Now, why did I need to highlight the privileges that Esau had? I wanted you to know that even though Esau became what he became, and we came to read in scripture later on where the Bible says, Esau, I hated. And you'll be wondering, could it be that that reduced him? I want to say no. It was his choice in life that brought him to missing out on what God could have given him. It was the, the choice he made that made him to lose inheritance that could have been his. Now, let's go ahead. The next thing I wanted to mark before I go on is the, the, the next thing in verse 27. I just wanted to mark it because when we come back, we'll be looking at this. So the boys grew and Esau became or was a, a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man, a quiet man dwelling in the tents. Can you please check that verse 27 for me, either from Good News or from any other version you have apart from King James? Can we read verse 28 from Good News? Verse 28, Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home, but Rebekah loved Jacob. New Living Translation. I didn't hear you very well. Can you read it loud? Verse 27. Good news. Good news. Verse 27. The boys grew up and Esau became a skilled hunter, a man who loved the outdoors. But Jacob was a quiet man who stayed at home. Isaac preferred Esau because he enjoyed eating the animals Esau killed, but Rebecca. All right. Preferred. All right. Thank you. We are told that Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country or a man of the field. 
But Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in the tents. Now, two issues that I first again want to highlight before we go ahead uh, this uh, moment in the study was the fact that when they say he became a hunter, that's the first indication of a choice that um, Esau made that may have led to whatever uh, omission of his life. Number one, when he said he became a hunter, you will notice that there's nobody in the family of uh, Esau that was a hunter. Neither from his mother's people's side, nor from his father's side. We know that Abraham uh, was a shepherd. And Isaac was a shepherd. You remember also that Rebekah, coming from the house of Bethuel, Bethuel was a shepherd. So we don't know where Esau learned to be a hunter. And let me ask, what is he hunting for? What was he hunting for? He was hunting for animals like rabbits, like um, rodents. And I was just wondering, with the amount of cattle, the amount of uh, the flock that his father has, even if he wanted to eat meat, one leg of a cow, if they slaughter a cow, just one leg of it will be more than 200 uh, of rabbits put together. But yet this young man became a man of the open country. A man who never stayed under family instruction. A man who was hunting from one bush to another just for what to eat. A man that is very destructive because some of the animals he caught, he was actually gradually expiring such species in the bush. There was a great difference between a hunter and a shepherd. So the first indication I was seeing about this man was the fact that what he had at home what was provided for him at home, first as the firstborn, born to a family of shepherds, he ignored it, and he seemed to prefer the little, little things that he would get when he went out into the bush, trying to hunt for animals. I noticed that because of his hunting expedition, he never stayed at home. We are told that he was a man of the open field. Another action say he was a man of the open country. If I were to explain what that meant, it meant that many, many times he would leave home. And for several days, he has not come back. He slept wherever night met him. He slept in the bush. And he ate raw things. Because he had no time to cook anything. All right. Um, now let's go ahead if you can look at your own life presently can you clearly identify the privileges you've had so far to become great and possess God which maybe you have not maximized as we are looking at this man Esau I want you just to note that we are looking at him not because we needed to criticize him at this time. He's already dead. But because his story had been written for us, we have a reason to study him so as to avoid whatever were his pitfalls so that we don't miss our own inheritance in God. Now let's go further to look at what value did he place on his birthright and eventually on what he could have possessed Let's check what value. You know, I said last week that you can never pay any price higher 
for a community, I mean for a commodity, higher than the value you place for it. I did say that every decision you make in life, you are always calculating, estimating, and making decisions based on your valuation. Now, we're going to see the value that Esau placed on his birthright, which may be the major, major challenge about his life that God may want us to look at today. Matthew, I mean uh, Genesis chapter 25, verse 32 to 34. No, no, before that, can we just pick it from verse uh, 28 again? 28, 29, uh, 30, up to 34. Uh, let me ask Priscilla to pick it up now and read from verse 28. You can read from the New King James Version. If you have it, do you have New King James? All right, Priscilla. Yep. Can you read that? Yep. All right, one second. From verse 28. Verse 28, and Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with the same red stew, for I'm weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die, so what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me of this day, as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Right. Thank you very much, Priscilla. Now, can you see the issue we want to check now? We wanted to understand what value did Esau place on his birthright? In other words, what value did he place on possessing that heavenly inheritance, that covenant that God was preparing to hand over to him through Abraham, Isaac, and he would have been, as we are talking about God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the next person we shall call will have been the God of Esau. Unfortunately now, let's see how he threw that away. Now, I want you to follow me as we study it very quickly. The Lord will help us this moment uh, as we study by the grace of God. Now, let's look at uh, verse 27. The first thing I noted in verse 27 is that Esau became a skillful hunter. He became a man of the open country, a man of the open field. That's what the Bible said he became. And uh, why Jacob was the kind of person who would like to stay at home. I'd already noted that by that virtue of choice he made, which he did not learn from his father, and he did not learn it from his mother's people, which means he actually began to derail, he began to pick a lifestyle that is very strange. He began to mingle with the men of the country in the bush. So several things that would have been family instructions to be passed on to him, he was possibly not available. All the altars that Isaac may have been building, while Jacob was there, Esau was generally in the open country where he had gone. So the first thing I noted is that here was a young man who never came home except there was a, a problem. Look at how the Bible put it. In verse 28, in verse, I uh, know, let's look at verse 29. In verse 29, Jacob 
cooked a stew. Jacob was cooking a stew when Esau came in from the field. If you look at your Bible, he said, Esau came in from the field. That means Esau just came in from the open country, from the bush where he had been. And how did he come in? He came in hungry. He came in tired. He came in weary. So now Jacob cooked a stew and he saw came in from the field and he was weary. Uh, Carla, can you check it from Good News? Can you check Good News of that verse 29? Verse 29. One day yes. while Jacob was cooking some bean soup, Esau came in from hunting. He was hungry. He was hungry. He was hungry. One of the things we are noting is that here is a young man that did not participate in family, family uh, affairs. He only came in when he was hungry. And you will notice that as soon as he ate, if you read verse uh, 34, the Bible said, and then he ate and went his way. It's a picture of the life of Esau. He will come in only when he's hungry and as soon as he's eating and he has taken something, he's on his way out again. No responsibility at all. No particular sitting down to learn anything. He was not participating in the family life. He was actually developing a wide lifestyle from outside. We're going to see that as we go on looking at his life. The Bible said he went his way. What it meant is that Esau's life was that of a truant. He comes in when he's weary or when he's hungry. He goes off once he gets whatever to grab. He never sat back to say, how is my father? How is my mother? What are we doing in the family? As the firstborn son, he never had space for that. I will be sharing with you furthermore what has happened to him. Now, the next thing I wanted to note, when we come to verse 30, and Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same rescue, for I am weary. The Bible said this is why his name was called Edom. Again, Edom that became his nickname now, was a name given to him because he loved red stew. And uh, those of us that came from this part of the world in Africa, when we went in those days hunting, when you are in the bush hunting, one of the strongest need is red oil. Because we are likely to roast a uh, yam on the field, but you need something to lubricate it in order to let it become soft on the throat. And red oil, palm oil, is usually the thing. So we saw how Esau could be so, so hungry for anything red to the point that everybody around knew him as Mr. Red. Apart from the fact that God seemed to have covered him with a, a kind of skin, an airy skin, that protected him from all the dangers that could have come. He again had a very serious appetite for anything red. So once he saw the rescue that his junior brother was uh, cooking, I'm not sure that the stew was already cooked. When this man said, please, please, Feed me with that same red stew right away. I am weary. Just let me eat it. Even if it is not well cooked, let me just eat it. And what was he going to do? He was to eat and go away. 
Now, what is the lesson that we are going to learn from this man? Number one, we have seen that. Esau began to lose his birthright, not the day he sold it out. He began to lose his birthright because he was not learning any family life. He was not learning all the legacies that Abraham passed on to Isaac, which Isaac ought to have passed on to him. You can see how much Isaac loved him, being the firstborn. But unfortunately, you can see that this young man was never available. He was not at home to be taught. He was not at home to be instructed in any way. His lifestyle is that of the open country. Secondly, we are noting here, I want you to see what he said. I'm still in that verse 29, 30. He said, Feed me with that rest too, for I am hungry, I am weary. That was why his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, oh, this is a very critical matter. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright first as of this day, before I give you a stew. Now, I'm looking at what value. It appears to me as if Jacob knew the value of being the firstborn. Jacob knew that the right that Esau had over him was going to be forever. And that no matter what, Esau was going to always take first because he came out first, even if it's only for five minutes. And Esau never understood, never valued that. So when Jacob was asking, sell me your birthright today, Sell me your birthright as of this day. And what was he going to use to, to sell his birthright? How much was he going to collect for selling his birthright? It was simply a spoon of pottage. Something he can just eat now, now, now. It was too important to him as to exchange his birthright for that which is ephemeral that which appears and immediately disappears. Sell me your birthright as of this day. I was wondering, no matter the hunger that is in Esau, that kind of request that Jacob made, should I woke him up and say, what? What do you mean? What do you mean by that? To sell you my birthright just because of the stew and the stew that he was cooking was taken from home, which means by right, by right. Even when Jacob had finished cooking that stew, by right, he ought to serve him. He was supposed to eat first by the right. But since he doesn't know and he doesn't value his bad right, we saw him negotiating. He said, send me your bad right as of this day. And he said, look, I'm about to die. Now I want to ask, did you see that exaggeration? People that easily lose their above right, people that easily give up on possessing that which is eternal, they exaggerate their temporary need. They exaggerate their temporary difficulty. Let me ask you, how can missing a meal just for an afternoon how can he kill a strong man like Esau? How can one meal, one meal kill him? We know that even if a man does uh, go, go without food for 40, 50, 60 days, it's not enough to kill him. The trouble now is not that he's not having water to drink, he could drink. And even the stew that he was going to look for I wonder how much is he going to get out of it? Now, he said, look, I'm about to die. I'm about to die. You know the way he put it, if you look at it, as if he was holding the last breath. As if any moment from now, in one minute time, he so will die. An exaggeration of a temporary problem. 
He said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Look at his question. What is this birthright to me? I'm going to die now, now. What do I need birthright for? And how many people are hearing me today that either because of a temporary need, a temporary need, you have exchanged something glorious of your life, something of a life, a life birthright, you have exchanged it for something simple, something little, you have sold out. We are going to be reading the biblical comment on Esau's action here later on. Now, I was looking at Esau's action here. Number one, I noted that he said, he said, I'm about to die. What is the use of my birthright to me? And then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. Now, if a man had strength to swear, that means he was not ready to die actually. If he was at that point of death, can you ever swear? Unfortunately, he had no strength to swear. And I imagine how he must have brought pen and paper and say, I, Esau, Edom, Isaac, in exchange for a spoon of uh, portage, I hereby from today sell out my birthright to my junior brother Jacob so that from today forward, he will be the senior and he will take first and whatever right appertains to me being the firstborn, I hereby hand over to him in exchange for a spoon of pottage. If you look at what Esau did in that passage, you then begin to understand why heaven looked at him as a man that cannot hold any eternal inheritance. Men that can easily give up over a little pressure. So he swore to him and he sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave his of bread and stew of lentils. Now I want you to again see, please permit me just to take a little time here. You will notice that Jacob was insisting, I'm not giving you any stew until you swear to me until you document it. And so the Bible said, Esau sold, I mean, swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. When I look at what this, what he gave him to eat, out of my curiosity, I went looking for lentils and I found that lentils is actually uh, it's tasteless. If you don't put other condiments to it, it is not sweet on its own. And yet, that was what Esau was dying for. That was what Esau was ready to exchange his eternal birthright for. That was what Esau uh, sold out in order to collect just spoon of pottage, as we are going to see later on. And so Jacob gave his up bread and, and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank and rose and went his way. So as we are looking at various ways in which Esau's action portrayed his inability to hold divine promises. I want us to explore it a little furthermore. Now, we have noted that uh, in chapter 25, verse 27, and verse 32 to 34, we have seen how he did not place any serious value on his birthright. We have seen that Esau did not, is not a man who can look ahead. He was a man of the immediate the only thing that bothers him is what I can eat now, now, now. He was not a man who thought ahead of time. 
He never imagined that he would live longer. He never counted the cost. What is the repercussion of selling his birthright? It never occurred to him. Actually, as soon as he ate the bread of lentils and he drank, the Bible said he rose and he went his way. He went back to the field. As if that's all that brought him home. Just to eat and to go. Just to eat and to go. We didn't hear anything that he did next. Apart from that he has exchanged his birthright. Now let's go to chapter 26. Let's go quickly to chapter 26. And we're going to read uh, verse 34 and 35. Let's quickly follow me to chapter 26. And verse 34 and 35. Let's quickly check what we can see about Esau's steel. Verse 34, Sister Priscilla. When Esau was 40 years old, he took as wives Judith, the daughter of Barry, the Hittite, and Basma, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And they were a grief um, of mine to Isaac and Rebekah. That's the next thing we're seeing about this young man. Now let me ask you, when he was 40 years old, how old was Jacob? How old was Jacob? Jacob also was 40. Because they were born the same day. I said, it's only five minutes difference. So, at 40, he had married two wives. Two wives that his parents did not know about. Two wives that were a source of grief to Isaac and to Rebecca. Remember that for Isaac to marry Rebecca, the father Abraham had to how to enter into an oath with his servant and say, Don't marry for my son among these people in which I'm living. Don't get unequally yoked with my son among these uh, daughters of this land. Go back. To my, to my people. So we saw the long journey that Eliezer took to go and find Rebecca for Isaac. For you to know that it was not correct, when it was time for Jacob, they also sent him to go back to go and pick a wife, not from the Canaanites, not from the people in which they are dwelling. That would be an unequal yoke. God has said you will not marry from the people of the land. But now, while he was hunting for rats and rabbits, you can see that he was also hunting for something else. He was hunting for girls. Jacob, I mean, uh, Esau was so reckless that he married the first wife and that was not enough. He married another one. So we are noting here that here was a man who did not think of contaminating the covenant? Who never placed value on the purity of the covenant that God made with Abraham and God made with Isaac, his father? Now, such a man, if God were to even give him space, we are discovering here now that he can easily throw it away. And I'm asking a question. I'm asking a question. What is the reason? What was pushing Esau? That at 40 years, he had taken two wives. He took as wives Judith, the daughter of Barry, the Hittite, and Basimath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. In all the stories from the word of God that we have seen, the Hittites, the Hittites, they have always opposed the children of Israel. Even if you go and read a little earlier, 
in the chapter 26, you will see that they have closed all the wells that Abraham dug. And when Isaac began to dig them up again, anytime he dug and he found water, they came and struggled with him and took it until he came to, 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 to Beersheba. I mean, to, yes, to Rehoboth, where God now found a place for them. Yet, it is this kind of people that Esau went to marry their daughters without any knowledge, without any information for his father and his mother. And these two ladies, they were not even uh, useful. They were a grief of mind. They were a trouble to Isaac and to Rebecca. Now, let's check furthermore. Chapter 27. Let's look at chapter 27. Please follow me to chapter 27. We're still looking at what was it that made Esau not to possess that eternal inheritance that God had in mind for him. 27 verse 35 to 38. Can we go through it? Yes. Verse 35 to 38. Maybe I should ask you to start from verse 34. But 35 to 38 are the issues we are trying to look at the, the manner in which the life of Esau was going. Yes, who is reading for me? Is, is a color ready to read? Yes, New King James Version? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me also, O my father. But he said, Your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. And now look, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Then Isaac answered and said to Esau, indeed, I have made him, I have made him your master and all his brethren I have given to him as servants with grain and wine. I have sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, have, have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me also, my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. Verse 39, 40 also. Jump and read from verse, from verse 41. Okay. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother, and it shall come to pass, when you become restless, that you shall break his yoke from your neck. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Amen. I will kill my brother Jacob. Now, when he said he has, he has, uh, look at what he said. He said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. I was going to find out, is it true that he supplanted him these two times? Was he not the one that by himself swore to hand over the birthright to Jacob. And if he has sold his birthright for a spoon of, of a pottage, what right does he have now to want to inherit the blessing of the firstborn? Even if Jacob did not do what he did to deceive their father, will it have been right should Esau not have come to tell the truth and say, my father, I hope you are thinking that you want to bless me because I'm your firstborn. But some time ago, 
I actually swore to Jacob that my birthright should go to him. He forgot what decision he took in haste. He forgot that for an exchange of a pottage, of a mess of pottage, he had given that birthright. Now the time to receive the blessing came and he was thinking that it was it was his right. But he saw that bad right before. Now we're going to see what that implies as we go to the book of Hebrews. And so I want you to note a few more things before I leave that issue. First, I noted that when he came and discovered that his, his brother has taken the blessing, it didn't occur to him that it was his own omission. It didn't occur to him that actually, if their father was in the spirit, if Jacob if Isaac was not carried away with the meat that he used to bring to him from, from the open country. Because I found that even the meat that he will have brought from the open country, his wife, Isaac's wife, knows what to prepare and it will give him the same taste. And if I mean Isaac ate it, and he never even felt as if it is not from the bush. Which means in the first place, Esau did not need to become a man of the bush, a man of the open country, for the appetite of Isaac to be met. And you know the way he spoke to Esau, he said, you must make us go quickly. I don't know when my day is to depart from the earth will come. Go and bring me food so that I can bless you. The way he spoke is as if, look, this is how you normally go and you don't return for several days. By the time you come, I may have gone. Be careful this time. Even Isaac was thinking that he was going to die. But if you take note of the Bible, Isaac lived so long. In fact, Abraham, I mean, Jacob returned back after all those years to still meet his father Isaac. Which means, even the decision to eat so that he will not, he will die. It's not valid. It's not necessary. But I was just looking at Abraham, I mean, at, at Esau. The father, he sold it and yet he wanted to collect it. He gave it out in exchange for something peripheral. And yet when the reality of the blessing came, he was looking for it. We're going to see what the Bible says about that as we go to the book of Hebrews very soon. Now, two things that I would like to still say about this man that will not allow him to inherit what God has for him before I draw the lessons that we can learn from Esau for this afternoon is number one, we saw a man who can take very costly decisions under pressure. We saw a man whose valuation is so, so inadequate, so wrong, that a spoon of pottage, he regarded it as equal to life. So what is the, I'm about to die, I'm about to die, I'm about to die. What is the use of my bad life to me? These are people that can easily, for what they can find, what they can eat, what can satisfy their immediate need. They don't mind selling out their eternity. He mortgage his future for something that he cannot even uh, see after two days. I imagine that he ate, he drank, and perhaps he just went to the toilet and everything was finished and he was gone. Now, let's now look at what the Bible says about Esau in the New Testament. Let's look at the biblical valuation on the life of Esau. Can we quickly go now to Hebrews chapter 12? Please go with me to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Right. If Priscilla has got it, 
Let's quickly read from verse 16. Perhaps you start from verse 15, actually. Okay. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause, cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Thank you. Thank you. Now, when you look at those verses we have just read, that is the summary of the life of Esau. That is the heavenly verdict about his life. And I hear God say, we must look carefully. We must be very, very careful, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble by this many be defied. What's the meaning of that? The first thing is that the grace that God was reserving for Esau. You see, what do we mean by grace? Grace is the unmerited favor, something you did not work for. Something that was bestowed upon you, not because of your merit. And that was what was being given to Esau. The birthright that he was given, he didn't work for it. He did not even qualify for it. And for him to be made the senior over and above Jacob, just because he came out first, five minutes, and because Jacob could not have taken the first place, he became his master for life. That was grace. Unfortunately, Esau did not follow it. Esau came short. <coughs> <coughs> He saw first shot of the grace of God. Threw away the grace of God. He saw for an immediate pressure. Sold out. What could have been his inheritance and his children's children would have been in it. I said God was offering himself to, to, to him. Just as God said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, God could have been called the God of Esau. Unfortunately today, he lost that. But let's see what God said about him still. He said, let there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau. Now, we are saying that Esau, from what we are seeing, he was a fornicator. I told you that when he was just 40 years, he had got two wives. Where did he get them? While he was hunting. We noted that he was not just hunting for animals. He was also hunting for girls. And we will not know how many girls Esau had trifled with in life before he finally got the two girls that he finally married? And we wouldn't even know whether it was not married by accident that made him to have these two women. I wonder how he alone was going to cope, cope with two Etite women struggling over his life Strange women in the family of Abraham and of Isaac. Now, he was a profane person. What is a profane person? A profane person is thoughtless. A profane person is a person who does not place right value on things. A profane person is someone who thinks, who thinks very, very casually about what he ought to have regarded with weight, with gravity. The Bible said, he said, of what use is my birthright to me? And so the Bible said, he despised his birthright. He sold it out. He ate lentils and he went away. 
He went back to the bush where he came from. He was a profane person. A person who does not have value for the future. He has no value for uh, consequences of present decisions. He's thoughtless. He never thinks and says, if I do this, what will happen? If I go this way, what will happen? If I took this decision, what will be the repercussion on me, on my children, on my children's children? He had no thought like that. The Bible said, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright? I must stop at this point to ask a few questions so that we can end the life of Esau uh, at this point. Now, first question. We are studying Esau not because it is Esau that matters to us. It's about you, my brother, my dear sister. You have come along in this Bible study or maybe you join us for the first time. I want to ask you, what privileges, what opportunities has God given you and you have thrown it away? What was the pressure that came on you that made you to exchange, to exchange your bad right, the glory that God has placed on your life, you have thrown it away? I'm asking you, are you a young lady? You got yourself disvergent just because a young man has promised to give you, I don't know how much he gave you. You are so thoughtless that you did not know that what you are exchanging for a small piece of dollar or whatever he gives you was going to cost you the rest of your life. Who are you listening to me today? What value do you place on the purpose of God for your life? We saw that Esau was profane. That's the first matter I wanted to raise. He wasn't thinking properly. He was thoughtless. He wasn't, he wasn't thinking of eternity. He just thought of what he can eat now, 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 now. Forgetting that Behind six, according to our local proverb, there is more than seven. After six, you have seven, you have eight, you have ten, you have two hundred. Some of you think that what you are doing today will be the end of your life. No. Some of you that tell, let me just, let me just close my eyes and just say, do it since I will soon die. They have lived so long only to regret the decision they took. Are there some of you that you are listening to me? The man you married was not the man you are supposed to marry. But because you are under pressure, you are under pressure, you are saying, well, let me just get married, whatever happens. Now you have married and in two years, everything has scattered. And your eyes are now open and you are looking left and right, what do I do? You must beg God for a second chance. Unfortunately, Mr. Esau did not have a second chance. The Bible said concerning Esau, he said, for you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, you see, he wanted to inherit the blessing of the bad right that he had sold. The only basis for Isaac to place the blessing on him was because he was the firstborn, but he had sold that bad right. So he now wanted to inherit the blessing. Look at what the word of God said. Afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. He cried, he wept. He said, my father, is there no blessing in your mouth for me? Is there no blessing in your mouth for me? And the truth of the matter is that everything that could have been is, Everything that could have been his as the firstborn, if he did not say that's bad right, was what was transferred and placed on Jacob. In fact, if you read what Isaac told him, it was so painful. He said, I have made him your master. You see, the power of invoking a blessing, I have made him already your master. As of now, Jacob has not become anything. 
But because of the blessing that was placed on his life, he has already, as far as Isaac was concerned, he has already become his master. He said, I have sustained him with grace. I have already blessed him with the blessings of the earth. Now, if you look back, I think, uh, Priscilla, please go back to that Genesis for us. Please go back. Uh, go back to Genesis. And please read again that verse 30, 35 to 38 of chapter 27. I want us to note what this brother lost and how he could not get it back. Genesis 27. Verse 35. Priscilla, can you get it? Yeah. Um, but he said, your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, if he not, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has um, supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. And now look, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Then Isaac answered and said to Esau, Indeed, I have made him your master and all his brethren. Your and master. Mm-hmm. And all his brethren I gave, I, um, have given to him as servants. With grain and wine, I have sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Look at that. I have made all his brethren have given to him as servants. With grain and wine, I have sustained him. What else can I do for you now? It was too late. That was actually his birthright. But because you sold it, for a temporary enjoyment, for temporary pleasure, this man lived and lived and lived until he died weeping. And I noted that the bigger problem with him that has compounded the problem of Esau and the Edomites is that decision he took. The Bible said he hated Jacob. He hated Jacob, that root of bitterness. Because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And he just said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. I seem to say, killing him will have transferred the blessing to him. It was the same thing that Cain did that would not allow him to become anything. He said, I'm taking that kind of decision and we did not know when it changed. Because up to the time that the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt, the Edomites were still on that same bitterness trap. Now, so I'm asking a question before I go from there today. I want to ask you, what is it that is so crucial that you are under pressure as to sell out your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? What is it that you think If I don't get it now, 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 now. Let everything go. What is it? Of what value is it that you are going to exchange eternity for that which is temporal? My dear brother, my dear sister, I'm asking a question. I hope you are not going on the path of Esau. I hope you are not selling out what God is reserving for you for your future, because of a little temporary pressure. I hope that the root of bitterness is not growing inside of you, rather than seek forgiveness from God. You are thinking of how to destroy those that seem to be progressing. Now, the ability that we could not find in Esau is what has brought him down. Can I ask uh, William to help us read the summary that we put in uh, under the word? It is clear. Can you read that to us? 
It is Brother Williams? Yes. It is clear that Issa val valued his birthright less than food. He said, what is <clears throat> the birthright to me? Temporary hunger made him to despise his birthright. He came, he could not en endure hunger or wait on God for God to provide for him his need, provide for his needs. It was the same kind of attitude that made him to rush to marry two Hittite women without his parents' consent. He was a man of self... Sorry, he, he was a man of self-ability. He missed the blessing of the firstborn. Isa was a man who had no capacity to hold divine divine trust. Heaven's con conclusive conclusion, sorry, about his life was that he was a fornicator and a profane person. Esau had no capacity to hold divine trust. Any man that can easily for what to eat, for immediate gain, can easily compromise. Heaven cannot put something heavy on that man's life. So I want to ask you, what is it? Is it, is it just your job? Is it just for your, uh, what you are going to get? Is it just the emolument that you are going to get that is making you now to sell out what God was preserving for you? What is it that is so crucial to you that you are exchanging your relationship with the Lord? We say that that kind of inability to hold on under pressure and wait for God to provide was the same issue that led Esau to marry two wives. In fact, when you go back and you reach chapter 28, when Esau learned that his father was not happy about his two wives and that they have sent his brother Jacob to go to Kadia to go and pick a wife from the house where Rebecca came from. When he learned that his parents have done that, instead of him to come back and talk to his father and mother and say, I'm sorry, these two women I, I, I brought upon you, I know they have brought you problem. You know what he did? He saw, rather went to Ishmael to go again and pick a wife. Can you imagine him running from, from, from fine pan to fire? He went again to the, to the closest rival of his father. You know how much Ishmael persecuted Isaac. How do you go again to go and pick a daughter from Ishmael? But that was his audit. When a man chooses or chooses not to submit to biblical instruction, that could have got from his father, he's likely to make more mistakes, more mistake, more mistake, more mistake in life. And that's what we saw him doing. Now, as I'm stopping on this issue, can I ask you, what is it that will hinder you? What is it that will hinder you from possessing God? What is it that will make you to lose your right into Christ? Because the Bible says we are, if we are sons, then we are heirs. We are joined heirs with Christ, which are inherit God. It's our birthright. Because being born again, we are born to be his heir. 
Now, what is it that you are doing that will make you to lose that birthright? What secret sin, what secret allurement is happening to you that will make you lose what God has freely bestowed upon us as his children? My brother, my sister, wherever you are, can I ask you again, what are you exchanging that which is eternal for? What is it? And I want you to be serious and be sober about this. Ask these questions. Do always I have tendency to give up? Am I always ready to exchange? Do I usually, you know, reshuffle the things of God, the things of the Spirit, just to meet, just to cope, just to stand shoulder to shoulder with ordinary men? Do you have that tendency of never valuing the grace of God in your life? What lessons can we draw from the life of Esau as we are concluding his own story today? What lesson could you draw from him? If we must possess God, must be ready to suffer afflictions and pass through difficulties. God does not approve anyone whom he has not proved. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him from them all. We have need of endurance so that after we have done the will of God, we may receive the promise. We must not be thoughtless, must not allow any affliction to hinder us from possessing uh, God. May God guide you in this. And may the Holy Spirit grant you understanding as we are looking at that particular entrance. If you ask me, what's the summary on the life of Esau? The Bible says it was profane. It was thoughtless. It was a man who miscalculated. Are there people listening or following our Bible study today? And you need to pray and say, Lord, I will never go on the way of Esau. I will never exchange Christ's life, Christ's provision for me, for which he died on the cross that I may have, I will not exchange it for something uh, something less. I will not sell out my life, sell out the grace of God, sell out what God had graciously provided and brought me into just for temporary pleasure or temporary relief out of hunger. I don't know what hunger is in your life. I don't know what need has confronted you. I don't know what challenges you are going through presently. But all those challenges, all those needs, as far as I can see, they are only coming to pass. They will appear now and they will not be there. You dare not sell out what will be your eternal inheritance just to solve a temporary issue like hunger. Young men, young women, brothers and sisters, some of you are even preachers, and you are losing your space in the purpose of God because of temporary things. Are you getting yourself into what you can quickly grab, and you are losing out your own space in the purpose of God? Now, with the time that we have left, I would like to stop at this point. I would have loved to begin Gehazi, but I know that the challenge we will have with Gehazi will not, I will not be able to finish it now. So I would like to stop at this note and then we'll take some few questions if there are and then we'll pray together asking God to help each one of us today that whatsoever it is, Whatever challenges you are facing, whatever need that has arisen from you, whatever difficulty you think you are passing through, if you be threatening you as if you are going to die now, now, now. But you see, I want you to know that that thing cannot kill you. If you hold on to God, God will promise God will have a great plan for your life is going to see you through it. It is not for you to sell out. 
It is for you to hold on. And we spoke about Daniel. We spoke about the three Hebrew children, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We saw how they stood their ground. Hunger is nothing to threaten them. Even furnaces of fire could not threaten them to exchange their inheritance in God. But Esau, simple hunger, will not allow him to remember that he is going on a long distance. As I stop here, let's pray first. Let me ask you to talk to God for yourself, and after which we are now going to take few questions if there are. And if there are no questions, then we take the rest of time to call on God together. Shall we pray together? Let's pray. Within this space, I want you to call on God directly for yourself right now. I want you to speak to God. I want to ask God, Lord, I have come into this study again. And I know that your purpose for me, you are drawing me to yourself. You are showing me that I can possess you. I can have you as my portion in life. And yet there are challenges. There are temporary needs, temporary issues that is confronting my heart and is making me to swing. I'm almost swinging. Lord Jesus, call my heart to order. Please call on God. Be, 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 be sincere as you talk to God for yourself right away. Are you on the verge of selling out? The word of God is coming to you today. Don't do it. Don't be like Esau. Are you on the verge? Are you on the verge of giving up? Just because you thought you are just going to die. You are not going to die if you believe the word of God. You are not going to end in shambles if you decide to hold God's word. Can you call on God personally? Or are you already in the position in which Esau found himself? Whereas Esau had no second chance. God has promised us today that whosoever comes to him, he will in no wise cast out. You can cry to God and say, Lord, I miss it. But since my life is still kept, I want you, Lord, to give me another chance. I want to return back to you. Whatever I have lost, Lord, I'm asking for opportunity to recover. Please call on God for yourself before I pray. And if you are just listening and you realize that, yes, for several years, you have always chosen the peripheral things. You have always fallen onto the pressure of immediate. And you have always lost the treasure of the heavens. And you are saying, Lord, please call me back. Have mercy on me today. God who is able to do much more than we can ask or imagine is going to help you. Just pray. Maybe you are in your private room. Maybe you are behind your office or whatever. Just take a little time to pray. If you can, go on your knees and say, Lord, I'm not going to sell out like Esau. You said, let nobody be like Esau. I will not be like him. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Father in heaven, we want to come to you. Know that you are God who answers prayer. And knowing that you have been guiding us since we began this Bible study, and particularly today, you have been so gracious to show us what will be the entrance to possessing God. Whereas we saw the rich young ruler the last time, who because of the possession he had, he walked away from life, he walked into utter darkness, and he walked away sorrowfully. But today we are looking at a man like Esau, whom grace was so much available to him. He had everything for him to succeed. Without doing anything, you, 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 you provided a blanket for his life. You provided a covering for his body. But rather than stay under your biblical instruction, he chose to be a man of open country. And Father, I am praying this evening, 
All those who are with us, all those who are listening and those that are praying and praying on you, please reach out to each one of them. I ask Father, whatever pressure has made some to go out of their home, out of the, 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 the coverage and the divine cover of the word of God, some are bolted away from home. Some have left their families. Some, they are born, they are, they are raised even by Christian parents. But they are going out there as if they are making an experiment of their lives. I ask this moment, Lord, please call them before they plunge into bigger problems, before they enter into the hand of the Hittites that eats them up. But I ask that you please call them. Pull their ears. Don't let them make more costly mistakes before they come back to you. Holy Spirit, those that are crying to you for restoration, please restore them. Call them back right now. Those, oh God, who have taken decision and say, I, 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 my, my choice was wrong before, but I want to come. Lord, I ask that as they open their hearts to ask Jesus to come into their hearts again. Please, Lord, Step into their lives. Give us a miracle for them. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 So if there are questions, yes, we'll brother. take a few questions before we conclude. Yes, Brother Lamp. The first question is, could Isa have made any better choices in spite of the prophecy? That could Esau have made better choices in spite of the prophetic word over him? That's one question that many people always uh, ask as if he was destined, as if he was predestined to make a mistake. You will notice that the choice that he made was his choice. Even those that God already know that they will misbehave. He gives them all opportunities that if they choose to do the right thing, it would have been all right for them. So may I say now that when we look at the life of Esau, the fact that God spoke about what he is going to choose from God's own uh, attribute and, and knowledge, foreknowledge of all things, it was not that God decided and said, okay, let me just incapacitate him. If God wanted to have done that, he would not have allowed him to confess. He would not have given him all the opportunities that he had. He would not have been given the opportunities even to make those choices. He was given the right choice. All of you have choices to make. If you choose to do the right thing, God's will for your life will have come to pass. If Esau has chosen with all the opportunities he had, something else will have happened for his life. So he could, he had the right to choose, but he chose to sell out his birthright. It was not prophecy that made him do so. It was his own personal greed. It was his own personal wrong valuation. It was the fact that he did not value his birthright. Amen. Thank you very much. And another question. If Esau sought with tears and never got it back, what's the hope for those who have lost it in line with Hebrews 10, <clears throat> excuse me, 26? All right. Thank you. Our brother is referring to Hebrews 10, 26. Let's quickly read it. Priscilla, can you read Hebrews 10.26 for us? Hebrews 10.26. For if sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Go on reading. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anyone who has rejected Moses 
law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the spirit of grace? Now, I want you to note that when you read from that scripture, if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. I ask Priscilla to read it down so that you can see on what condition that could ever happen. If anybody had missed it, but he has not come to a point where we're reading in verse 29, so of how much worse punishment do you suppose? Will it be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which it was sanctified a common thing and has insulted the spirit of grace? Now, these three issues, I'm not sure anyone who is seeking repentance, who is seeking restoration, has done. If you are still there crying to God and say, Lord, have mercy on me, and you are crying in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are believing that the blood that cleanses you from sin in the first place is still available to cleanse you now, there is a chance for you. There's a second chance for you. And that second chance is still predicated on your repentance. But when you look at the passage we read in Hebrews 12, uh, Priscilla, go back now to Hebrews 12 and see what they said particularly about Esau. And I want you to look at it. Please check it. Verse 16 and 17 is what you read. Read it again. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, 16 and 17. Yes. Um, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who was for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance. Though he saw... What he did not find place for was for repentance. Are you hearing me? The only reason why he had no chance is that he had no, he, had, he found no place for repentance. Even as you saw all that happened to him, did you notice that he never repented? He never repented for selling that bad right. Never repented for going outside the family instruction to go and marry the Hittites. Rather than doing that, he went furthermore. What made his case compounded is that he had found no space for repentance. Everyone who is listening to me now, there is space for repentance. There's an opportunity for repentance. Doesn't matter how far you have gone, you can repent. There's a space for repentance. The fact that somebody is hearing this message, this Bible study, is because there is a space for repentance. What he saw did not find is that he had found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. You see, weeping without repenting is not the same. There are many people that I see them having tears of remorse, tears of regret. But tears of regret, tears of remorse, it's not equal to repentance. Repentance means going back to undo what you have done and to plead with God for, the, for, for, for restoration and for forgiveness. Can you imagine that Esau did not do that? Esau rather said, my father will soon die, I will keep Jacob. What he meant is that I'm going to finish everything that could be remembered of my father. How did this, how, how could he prove that he loved even Isaac? 
which means if he had opportunity, he could have made his father childless. That's what he was saying. It was because of that that Jacob and I mean Isaac and uh, Rebecca decided and say, Jacob, come and go quickly. Because your brother is still breathing a breath of threat. If he was so sober and say, my father, actually, Esau did not supplant me. I mean, Jacob did not supplant me. I was the one who sold my birthright to him for a small portage. I said, did you do that? Why did you do that? He would have had opportunity of repentance, but he did not repent. So if you are listening to this, uh, this Bible study, I want you to know that whatever, whatever you missed, whatever you lost, know there is a space for repentance. God has a space for you. Uh, Priscilla, please go back again and help us read Hebrews chapter 6 so that we can put this matter uh, completely. Because all the time, when you find somebody as if he can no longer have a second chance, it's always that they cannot be renewed to repentance. Please go back to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews 6. Sister Priscilla. Hebrews 6. All right, are you there? Can you read from verse, verse 4? Up to verse 5, 6. Can you read it? <laughs> for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Can you see what is the matter there? It is because if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, that's what the Bible is saying, it is impossible. Anybody can repent, anybody that can repent will find pardon. Anybody that can return back to God in repentance, God will have mercy on him. But the trouble now is that because they are tasted and they were once enlightened, they have tasted the heavenly gift, that they become partakers of the Holy Spirit, they have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they find a way to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. So if, if all that they have experienced did not stop them, from coming back in repentance. If they don't become arrogant as to think that, no, I can't go back, I can't go back, then if they can come to repentance, there is hope for them. Repentance is the man that cannot get uh, his sins to be pardoned. So take note, what happened to Esau that we are saying he did not find a space is because he did not find a place for repentance. Those who trample upon the word of God, upon the Son of the living God, who take the blood of Jesus as a mere thing, and who insult the spirit of grace, these are all the means that God uses to bring men who have come into repentance back to God. So if they cannot repent, how can God? Will God Lower his standards, that's the only matter. So if any man can repent, he has space uh, to be pardoned and to be restored and to be given a second chance. Right? Do we have any other question or or you Amen. need to conclude now? Um, we thank God for his leading, for your answer. You have covered the other questions. And so we thank God for that. So we can proceed to, to close the meeting at this time. Uh, what I want to remind everyone, if you still would have other questions, please feel free to contact um, the persons in your area. Ask Brother Dan to put up the contacts for 
the other persons just before we close in prayer. Um, so, Bradan, can you show the the contacts? I trust that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you as he has been speaking to me from the message that has gone forth this morning. We trust that God would help us to come to the point of repentance and uh, getting there, we'll be able to, to come back to him and to inherit what he has given to us. We trust him for this. As you can see, um, for those who are in Belize, you can, that's contact number. And um, brother Dan in the States, brother Vincent in Canada, brother Dale. And, uh, in the UK, brother Goke. We trust that through these mediums, you can still reach out to us and, um, God can help respond to some of the questions we have. We want to ask Brother Magania to close for us in prayer. We thank you again for joining us. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you today, Lord, because you have been very clear in the way you have spoken to us. You have made it known to us, Lord God, that if there is any hindrance in us possessing you, it is not because you are the one obstructing or you are the one holding. It is us. It is the decisions that we make. It is how we value you, your eternal gift, how how much value we put to the wonderful things that you are doing for us in our life. And I pray, Lord God, that what we have heard today, that we have heard it with open hearts, that your Holy Spirit, Father, will impress it so that we might be able to make the decisions that are right, the decisions, Lord God, that will not only benefit us in our lifetime, but it will benefit our children and our children's children. I ask this morning, Father, as we close this session today, that every single person that have listened to this message today, take it to heart. Seriously consider it, Lord God, because what you are doing, you are preparing a people for your kingdom. As we have heard in the questions that were asked, there might be people who may turn away from the good things that you are offering. But I also praise you, Father, because you are able to receive us back if we can only humble ourselves and repent of the deeds that we are doing and that our hasty decisions, our choices that we make sometimes may take us away from that grace that you are offering to us. So today, Lord God, we thank you for your manservant who delivered this message to us in such an articulate way that everyone can understand. I ask Holy Spirit, take our hearts and mold it to suit you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you again for joining us this week. Please feel free to join us next week at the same time in your time zone. And uh, may God bless you and reach you and comfort you. And he, ha- he stands with open arm to receive all who are willing to repent from where they are. Amen.